computer. And it's all you, Lisa. Okay. Good evening and welcome to another edition of the YWCA's Enlightened Conversation. This evening, we're talking to Matt Schaefer, who is the Executive Assistant for Reentry with the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. Now, don't worry, I haven't done anything yet that landed me in his department, but we're talking about a really important issue um, that applies to his area, and that is the issue of what happens after someone has served their time and they're ready to go home. What do they do? How do they make that transition from inmate to community member? It's not necessarily an easy transition to do, but Matt's gonna to explain to us exactly how that happens, how they prepare someone who's been in prison to resume normal life again, and what that takes on both the part of the corrections department and on the part of the individual. Matt, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and thanks for having me. It's a privilege to be here and hopefully we can uh, answer any questions that you may have. And I do have a short presentation. We can start with that, kind of explain what our process is for uh, release and kind of the preparation that happens while they're still in prison before they actually do get released. So we can start with that. So I'll share my screen and hopefully this works. Okay. All right, so in the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, we, um, we oversee all the reentry efforts um, throughout um, anybody's time within the institution. So usually reentry starts at about 18 months prior to the release date. We like to say that reentry really starts as soon as you get to prison. Um, but the bulk of the work happens later on, about 18 months to 12 months prior to release date. Um, so the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections Reentry Office is overseen by Deputy <coughs> Secretary Kelly Evans. And um, through that, there are several different bureaus. So the first one we'll talk about is the Bureau of Reentry Coordination and Justice Reinvestment. So under that bureau, we have the Division of Treatment Services, Division of uh, Corrections Education, Division of Reentry Services and Operations, and then our Justice Reinvestment Initiatives as well. And for treatment services, basically those are any of our um, substance abuse or substance use treatments. Uh, we also offer medication assisted treatment to anybody with substance use disorder. And uh, we also have various non-SUD treatment programs, like Thinking for a Change is one of our most popular one. We also offer um, programs that are specific to women at our two female facilities. And um, anger management, there's also different religious services that fall under treatment services, as well as our classification, uh, which is just when somebody comes into prison, we classify them to see what type of needs and um, areas of improvement they have. And then their treatment plan is, is based off that. So that's the vision of treatment services. And then this is just the breakdown of some of the programs that are offered um, by treatment services. Also, uh, if for some reason they can't complete the programming while they're inside the prison, we also have alternatives for them to complete once they're released on parole as well. So we don't necessarily hold somebody up from being paroled 
on, you know, if they're recommended for a treatment program, but can't get into it due to the, the length of their sentence. We have uh, some people with rather short sentences, so we would rather release them and then have them complete the treatment programs outside of prison if possible. And under our office as well, we have Division of Corrections Education, and that's all of our um, GED, Commonwealth, secondary diplomas are offered. Um, we actually have quite a bit of people who go through our high school programs because uh, we do have people that are under 18 and those that are you know within the, the age range that they can complete their secondary diploma as well. So we do offer that. We offer um, different partnerships with colleges to get post-secondary education as well. And we're always looking at ways to expand that. Uh, we offer business education classes. One of the things that's mandatory for most people are victim awareness classes. So those are offered at all of our institutions. Yeah. And uh, we also offer various vocational uh, training opportunities at each of our prisons as well. Matt, can I ask you, what's the difference between a GED and a Commonwealth Secondary Diploma? Um, so the GED is uh, tracking, and, and this isn't my area of specialty, but like the GED is something that you would go through in lieu of a high school diploma. So it's an equivalency degree. Okay. And the, the Commonwealth Secondary Diploma just means that you've met all the benchmarks and, and the criteria to graduate from uh, a high school. So, okay. you know, if you, I forget all the rules around it, but if you're eligible um, to complete your secondary diploma, that's probably um, more advisable than going the GED route. But um, a lot of folks go the GED route because they're either too old to complete the secondary diploma or whatever the various reasons they are for doing the GED program. But either way, you're you're getting the equivalency of a, a high school. Of diploma. a high school. Okay. And then this is probably hard to see, but these are all of our vocational programs that we offer throughout the Commonwealth in our prisons. Uh, one of our more popular is our flagger program. So it's like highway flagger. Um, yeah. It's a big growth industry right now. And a lot of the companies that offer this, they don't generally discriminate on background. So it's, it's a easier, pathway to finding employment. Uh, we also offer OSHA 10 um, and a whole lot of other industry uh, recognized courses and, and certificates. So we've really done a, a good job in the last five to 10 years of making sure all of our programs are meeting what the employers you know, expect out of somebody who went through a training program. And uh, we spent a lot of time and, and energy trying to get those to where they are now. We also offer one of our one of our um, more popular is you know the barber shop or cosmetology, mm -hmm. uh, and the, that usually ends you know is a good pathway to a good career path as well for some. And um, we offer the barber certificate, so they actually sit for their um, state certification and, and their testing while they're in prison. So whenever they leave, they have, you know, the, the state certified barber. Um, so it's, it's a good That's experience. For most. Do you help people find jobs then when they're ready to be paroled or to be dismissed? Yes. Uh, yeah. we workforce development coordinator, and we also have um, different folks within our system. And we partner with other agencies like um, Office of Vocational Rehabilitation and, and yeah. Career Link and um, Department of Labor try to help get as many people employed as possible. That's good. Um, and we really spend a lot of our time focusing on those that are living wage occupations and trying to find certifications that 
you know, get them to a point where they can enter the job market and find something with a, a living wage, not just, you know, a part-time job or, or anything that they can find. We really try to focus on, you know, a career goal and a career focused path for them um, once they are released. So we do a lot of work while we're inside to try and get them to that point and then hopefully it transitions to a decent paying job once they are released. Right, great. Sounds good. Uh, the Division of Reentry Services and Housing also offers um, community-based options for treatment and other services that typically were underfunded or unfunded. So things that people, when they were released, they didn't necessarily have the funds to uh, pay for their own treatment or um, sometimes it's something simple like workforce development or family reunification. So we, um, in 2012, we took on the responsibility through justice reinvestment. It was a legislative um, action that kind of propelled this and uh, we now use Department of Corrections funds to uh, provide services for people once they're released on parole or probation to hopefully reduce the likelihood that they'll return to us as, as either parole violators or new commitments. So mm -hmm. um, to date, we've uh, focused a lot of energy and we, we now have um, 10 different uh, service areas that we look at. So we, we offer sex offender treatment, day reporting, housing assistance, mentoring, workforce development, family reunification, outpatient substance use disorder services, cognitive behavioral interventions, outpatient mental health, and also batters interventions. Um, we also have a, a housing coordinator who works with the local markets to try to assist people who are having a hard time finding housing. And they can sometimes be that, you know, connector to get people into um, whatever housing that they're looking for and sometimes find, you know, alternate um, funding streams or be able to work with some of our partnering agencies to, to try to help with placements as well. Mm -hmm. And then this is just the list of the different um, criteria and the um, different services that we do offer. So we kind of talked about them, but we can just leave that up for a second. Okay. So it sounds like there's pretty much something for most of the offenders who come before you. You've got something to offer them to help them when they're released so that they don't have to do the same thing again and end up back in front of you again. Is that... Am I understanding yeah. that correctly? Yeah, we, we offer our services to everybody. Um, we do our best. It's We release quite a few people a year, so we do our best to hit everybody. Um, sometimes we don't hit everybody because either we are um, missing a critical position at, at a certain prison or um, either that or the offender just decided that he didn't want to uh, take part in reentry services as well. So we don't mandate that they go through reentry services, but we, we hope that they do. Right. And you can't force them to do this. You just make it available, right? Right. Yep. And kind of so, talk it up, encourage them. <laughs> right. So, yeah. And that's been our, our main focus for at least the past year is getting the word out, making sure that they know that we're there. Um, COVID was a difficult time for everybody and especially us as well. Yeah. Um, so we didn't have the ability to bring people in large groups, which is the way we usually offer our reentry workshops. So we actually developed a reentry workbook so that they could do it on their own um, and then get staff assistance when needed. So that was a way to continue to actually deliver the services when we couldn't have a large group setting. Um, so we've done our best and we're still learning about how to deliver the services better. And we have some, some hurdles that we have to cross to every now and then, but 
we're we're getting to a point where we think we're we're hitting as many people as we possibly can and, right. and we're in a good spot right now so um as far as reentry services we have a reentry service office in each one of our prisons so um that is staffed with a reentry parole agent and a reentry specialist so those two employees kind of do a lot of the, the hands-on workshops and one-on-one -on -one assistance with the individuals. There's also social workers in all of our institutions that help with release planning as well. So they, they can do a lot of the coordination of, of services and making sure that um, you know care is, is met once they're released and kind of set up some appointments and, and help out where they can as well. So, um, our reentry service office is really geared for those that are 18 months to either their their parole date or their maximum um, date. So when they max out, and we offer a wide variety of workshops. I think the next slide has um, the actual works the workshops that we offer. Oh no, I lied to you. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, we offer. Um, release planning we offer living under supervision which is the class that teaches people what to expect when they're on parole and what the rules of parole are mm -hmm. uh, we offer financial and budgeting workshops we have a, a renters workshop that explains kind of the process of securing an apartment um, the do's and don'ts with leasing and and uh, setting up your utilities and what a good budget is for an apartment. We also have um, a computer lab in each one of our prisons that has internet capable computers that have certain websites that are preloaded that they can um, work on any reentry needs that they have. Um, we work on getting their, um, their three main identifications so birth certificate, so security card and identity and uh, state ID card or driver's license, depending on um, if they're able to do that. And then um, about, you know, six to six months or so before they get out, we really start focusing on the reentry plan and their exit plan. And uh, that's when a lot of the job searching starts up again too. Um, we, uh, we have an agreement with uh, Department of Labor and Career Link that we um, give the the inmates the ability to log into the Career Link website to to do job searches and um, that's been pretty beneficial so far with that agreement and, and we How we do you handle interviews for jobs do they do those over um, a Zoom or do people come into the prison to interview prospective employees? Sure, we've had both scenarios where we've set up either virtual um, interviews or phone interviews. We also offer um, reentry fairs and job fairs throughout the year so employers can come in and, and meet with potential employers. Um, but for the most part, we, we recommend that they, if they know that they um, are gonna get out, that they try to line up their job applications to closer to after they get released. So that way they don't have to um, cross as many barriers to get that interview accomplished. So, um, but we have had uh, quite a few over the years where we've worked it out and, and made the, you know, whatever um, concessions we had to do to make sure that they had uh, a, a positive interview. So we, oh, we good. everybody to um, have as much uh, of a chance as possible. So if, it, if that requires, you know, setting up a phone call with an employer, then we're more than willing to do that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And then um, the next thing we'll briefly talk about is justice reinvestment and um, kind of what justice reinvestment is, is it's taking that the funds that would have been used on the back end in corrections and, and trying to um, ensure that either people don't come into the, to corrections anymore or stop okay. the, the, the flow back in with, with repeat offenders. So um, we have different 
program. So we have a, a drug treatment program, which actually, if they're successful, will take time off of their sentence if they complete it. And then we also have a boot camp program um, that is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, we do have a video on our website. If you want to learn more about the boot camp program, it's it's pretty interesting that it's an intensive program um, designed for those that are about to be released on parole. Um, tries to instill discipline and and it's pretty it's pretty interesting and unique. So um, if you're interested, you can go on the Department of Corrections website and learn more about that. Um, but really, it's it's trying to find the most cost effective methods of keeping you know those who are in prison in for the shortest amount of time and get those out and keep them out um and you know legislation expected to save about 45 million dollars over five years with the last um justice reinvestment initiative so that was 2019 so we're still a couple of years away from that benchmark but um we we do as much as we can and we we really try to push our our programs yeah so short sentence parole is another program that came under jri too and that's um making criteria for those uh who have shorter uh, minimum sentences to try to get them out on parole quicker and that's been pretty successful as well that sounds good Next thing we'll talk about institutional parole. So each one of our prisons has an interest, institutional parole office, and they're really responsible for preparing the cases for the actual parole board to review. Uh, basically, they create uh, either they complete assessments or they create different documents for the parole board to use during their interview process. Uh, we begin that process about eight months prior to the inmate's minimum sentence. And then um, we'll work with that individual until they're actually released. So we're kind of the uh, the parole boards um, workers inside of the prisons. So this is the the very detailed map of the parole process um, that can be found on our website as well. But it kind of walks you through a typical case um, and what we do to prepare people for parole. So that usually starts about eight months uh, prior to their minimum date. And then we'll uh, work with that individual the whole way up until they're released from the institution. Okay. And then kind of why, why what we do matters. 90% um, of all the people that are in prison are going to be released. So, um, they're going to come home, they're going to come home, and we want them to be as prepared as possible when they do come home. Um, number of releases that are uh, rearrested within six months of release, so that's 12.3%. So within that six months, we really want to make sure that number stays as low as possible. And then number of releases that are rearrested with within one year is 23.7. So really when we talk about that critical moment, that's within that first year, um, even so within the six months. So that's rearrested with a new crime. Our um, overall PA recidivism rate is 62%. So that's including technical parole violations. So being uh, returned back to a prison for violating the rules of supervised release, and that can be for as short as a couple of weeks, upwards of one year um, return to a prison. So um, overall, you know, the more that we can get them prepared, the, the better everybody is and the safer we all are. So um, what we do, you know, we, we feel like it matters a lot, so. It's, it certainly does. How does that 62% <laughs> compare to other states, Matt? Are we, is Pennsylvania in a good spot or not a good spot as we're far generally as recidivism? Uh, yeah, we're, we're generally in a good spot. It's hard to measure because each state has a different definition for recidivism. So oh, it's, okay. it's it, there's, there's not really one um, general definition. So each entity uses a different 
different definition. Um, we in Pennsylvania we use rearrest for a new crime as well as um, being returned to a DOC facility or DOC custody. So our numbers um, are pretty high in some regards because we are very inclusive. Um, some of the other states only use things like uh, new convictions or they'll use arrest but not return to custody for technical violations. And, and some states don't have parole, so it's even a little bit more complicated as well. So um, we're doing we're doing well uh, in our state and we're, we're tracking as far as, you know, where the national average is, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Yeah, good, good. You said that 90% of the people in Pennsylvania prisons come home. The other 10% are, were sentenced to life sentences. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. And how many people are, do we have in state prisons in Pennsylvania? So, oh, I should have been more prepared. I think that's uh, about... okay. Just ballpark. <laughs> In, in our wow. state prisons, and in our state prisons, I think we're at about thirty-seven thousand. Thirty-seven thousand. Okay. Which we're yeah. we're way down compared to where we were. Um, That's 10, good, isn't it? To yep. be down, I would think. We're, we're. I think our our high point was around fifty-one thousand. So we're we've made a lot of effort and put in a lot of work to to keep that number down. And, um, you know, it's not all us. There's been some other changes and different laws that have passed. So, you know, it's been a, a group effort, but we continuously see that trend go down year after year. And we've met That's every good. goal and we just keep hoping that that trend continues. Yeah. And see that number decrease more and more. Yeah. It would be nice to think that that's down because people aren't making the mistakes and committing the crimes as much. And I, and I think that might be, well, I'm, I'm you know, naive enough to think that maybe some of that plays a part, but I'm sure there's other parts and pieces to it that weigh uh, much heavier in that analysis. But I'm glad to see that it's, it's a lower number than what it once was. So Absolutely. I'm sure that helps with managing the population and and crowding and all that sort of thing too so, absolutely yep the, le the less people the the more safer our prisons are and the more safer our communities are so yeah we, we want to see um that number continuously decrease so that i mean we're at a manageable amount now for most for the most part but uh, the less people in prison the better yeah yeah. How many state prisons do we have, Matt? We have 24, including our training academy. Okay. Um, so we're, we've closed a few over the years, but um, I don't believe there's any talks of any more closures. And there's a process mm -hmm. that, that has to be followed for that. So um, it's a pretty public process. So if, if oh, there's sure. talks, then everybody would yeah. probably... Um, Everybody would know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, but if you've got 24 of them and you've got this um, re entry training going on at most of them, that's a lot of work happening. So, um, that's that's a, a lot of, of people that you're preparing to resume life in the community. So, do you find that? Of the 90% that are going to be going home at some point, do most of them take advantage of these assistance and training that you have for them? Yeah, and, and we've only been running the, the RSOs for a few years, and we've had different pilot programs, and our turnout is, is very good. Um, we continuously build on that and our current process and our current design um, we've only been operational for about two years and in each prison we see you know over probably two to three thousand people involved in in the rso at each prison so we're really seeing the benefits of it um, that's good and it just continues to grow and I think our last one came online a couple of months ago. So 
we finally hit where we want to be. And um, a lot of our COVID restrictions have kind of um, not gone away, but lessened so that we're able to get more people into one space. So the workshops have resumed in a lot of the, the yeah. institutions where they could. So that's definitely, you know, we can, we can throw people, um, you know, resources and packets and everything, but having that, that personal touch to it really does make a difference. Yeah, interaction makes a big difference in training. It really does. So do you hear from people who have been released and took advantage of the uh, re-entry training that you have? Do you hear anything back from them as to what part of that training was most helpful or they wish they would have had more of this and not so much of that? Yeah, we, we did interviews um, over the summer with um, a focus group and we collected some data from that. We do a survey. Um, we're also studying the, the effectiveness of our design. So really we, we look at all those elements and we revamp our workshops periodically based on, you know, as things change. And I'll tell you like over COVID, the way that we had to, to go about um, everything and, and change everything and modify everything to either web-based or, or virtual really showed us a lot on, on how to not be so stuck in our ways and, and make the changes that need to be made um, to move forward. So um, I think that happened yeah. to all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah. yeah, the easier ones to, to visualize are like um, our process for getting somebody a social security card um, relied heavily on our working, you know, ability with the social security office in each location. And then having that person at the social security office no longer there and working from home was a big um, barrier oh. that we had figure out and um as well as identification so when somebody gets released and they're used to just showing up at PennDOT and walking in and spending you know 30 45 minutes to get an ID now when you go to PennDOT the line's three hours deep outside mm -hmm. and right if you didn't set up an appointment at some of them you didn't get in that day so a lot of the rules changed and we had to to make sure that we were communicating with our partners and making sure we know, you know, the process that we have to follow as well. Um, because a lot of things change and and we learned that and we <laughs> had to adapt pretty quickly as so did everybody else. But right. Yeah. yeah. It just makes it that much harder. Um, yeah. what's the biggest impediment to um, a successful transition from prison life to coming back home. What's the thing that, that trips people up the most? Um, that's, you know, a very relative, or it's, it's really case specific for the most part. I mean, I can give you generalizations, but everybody's okay. different. And when we prepare for release and we do our release planning, we really, um, make sure we focus on, you know, individual goals and, and what that individual and, and really it's, they got it, the, the treatment programs, the, the reentry plans, they have to be meaningful to that individual to work. So we really want to hear what they think they need to be successful as well. Not just what we think would make them successful. Uh -huh. That makes sense. We, yeah. We really try to individualize our, our case planning as much as possible, but really the big ones are, are always going to be um, substance abuse, um, mental health and, uh, lack of employment, lack of finances, relationship issues. There's a long list of barriers mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that, that trip people up. And it's really relative to that individual and, and what their circumstances are at that time. Sometimes it's, you know, one thing changes and everything changes for either the better or the worse. So mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing that we tell them is, you know, when, when they do feel like something's changing, reach out you know, get the help then. Don't, you know, bottle it up and wait till it's too late and then everything explodes around you. So right. get get help when you can. People are here to help. Um, and really just listen to your, your gut and make sure that 
you know, you're being cognizant of things that could trip you up. Um, and that's the hard part too, right? So like, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, everybody working with humans has that same problem. So. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter <laughs> what the situation is. Um, do you find that most people um, are anxious and excited about going home or apprehensive? Uh, for the most part, anxious and, yeah. and excited. Uh, for most people, that's, you know, they, they want the world to return to normal. To normal, yeah. And, and get back and um, be with their family and, and their loved ones. And um, for some people, that's a hard reality. And others, you know, they, they transition relatively easily. So mm -hmm. it's different for everybody. and. The supports, you know, uh, if they if they have good supports, then it's hopefully they use those supports, build that support up, and and use it for when things do get rocky. Um, and we have a lot of peer mentor programs, and we have a lot of um, professional assistance that we can offer folks. So, you know, we constantly say if if you're falling down if you're having issues you know that's the time to reach out before it's too late and try to you know correct some of these problems before they you know spiral out of control before they become big problems <laughs> right exactly. yeah. what can those of us um on this side of the community prison system, you know, the, those of us who are in the community who may have a job opening or may have uh, an apartment to rent or, you know, something like that. What can we do to make this a little easier for people who have, you know, they've paid their time, they've done what they've needed to do, they're, you know, they've, you know, they're, their debts are paid, you know, they're, they're square with the, with the legal system now. So what can we do to make this an easier transition for them? Sure. Um, give them a second chance. Uh, a lot of times it's all they need is, is an opportunity. Um, but at the same time, you have to make good decisions too. Uh, so, you know, use the information that you can legally obtain and, and make your decision the same way you would normally make a decision. If, if they seem like a good fit for your employer, um, then, then give them a chance. And a lot of times our, our uh, folks that are returning to the workforce, they, they have skills, they have abilities, and they just need that second chance. And they'll be very appreciative of it and they'll show up for work and they'll, they'll want to do a very good job because they know how hard it is to get that second chance. Yeah, yeah, they don't want to blow it. Yeah. Nope. Um, okay. Well, because of our technical issues, we can't really um, ask for questions from the listeners because they're going to be listening to this after you and I are long gone off the air. But I do want to make sure that people I'll, have the opportunity. Sorry, Lisa. I'm just going to go forward to where my information where is. Yeah, that's what I was going to do. You've got it taken care of there. The, Matt's email is there, M-A-T-S-H-E-A-F-F-E -F -F -E at PA.gov, and uh, that you can get in touch with him if you have questions or comments that you would like to share um, about the program or you have you want more information about the program the program for re-entry after, um, after the prison term has been served. If you have um, questions or comments about um, enlightened conversations, you can get in touch with me, L. Smith at ywcahanover.org, or you can get in touch with um, the front desk with Lou at L. Mart at ywcahanover.org as well. So you've got a couple of different opportunities. There's Lou. You have a couple of different opportunities there to get more information. Um, but Matt, I thank you. I appreciate your uh, your help tonight and your 
your grace under pressure and being able to to kind of switch gears when um, when Facebook didn't work for us this evening. So did you have anything else you wanted to add before we close up? No, just thank you. And if, if you have any questions, please reach out. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, we appreciate uh, your time and we certainly will uh, make sure that people have that information. Lou will get this um, packaged up and like he always does, this is edition number 20 of Enlightened Conversations and you'll be able to, uh, folks can, will be able to find it on the, the list on the YWCA Hanover website and we'll send you a, a link to that then Matt. Uh, once that's all finished. So um, for those of you who are watching that link, I thank you for your time and thank you, Matt, for yours and wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving. Good night. Take care, everybody. Thank you. All right. Well, okay. Well, that technical worked out all right. It went quite well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Technical difficulties notwithstanding, you know. So that's that slideshow was great, Matt. That really helped. Thank you. So Thank that really